Hi, I'm Meta Spencer. Today we're going to go to Vancouver uh, because I've just made a new friend who's in Vancouver. It's Michael Barnard. He is a man of many parts. He obviously knows his way around technology, all kinds of technology, kind of a renaissance man of technology. And in fact, he's so sophisticated that I wouldn't dare try to introduce him and say what he does because I would be sure to mess it up. So good morning, Michael. And uh, would you be so good as to tell us a little bit about yourself so you can sort of do a self-introduction if you don't mind. What is this thing in the background? Well, th thank you very much for having me, Meta. I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, the thing in the background is actually a project I'm working on uh, with uh, my firm, Distance.com, Distance Technologies, and uh, a local architecture practice, Human Studio Architecture and Urban Design, focused on increasing sociability in the built environment. That's a, a five-story office building or five-story residential building with a courtyard. And what we're doing is using 3D agents in a virtual environment to run around the building and encounter one another and determine which designs of the building are more sociable versus less sociable. Uh, and, and that's in line with my focus on public health and um, you know, social good projects, you know, which is the reason I'm here today. Yeah. Um, the public health stuff, I mean, we're doing in the middle of COVID, which Meta's, you know, and I were chatted about in our original conversation uh, a week or two ago. Uh, but COVID is actually being managed in Canada by the Panorama Public Health Surveillance Project, uh, something built in British Columbia, which I had the privilege of working on for 18 months. Now these, I see little green lines zigzagging around this building. Is this a kind of graph of where people move inside the building complex? Well, no, that's two agents in space who can see one another. The, the green line is the laser between their eyes. Oh, really? Yeah. And they're, uh, why are they trying to see each other? Well, just because when you walk out of your building, you see your neighbor, you'll say, oh, you start to learn to recognize them. You'll say hi. And yeah. then eventually you'll establish familiarity with your neighbors. And at a certain point you say, well, you know, we haven't seen Fred for a while. I wonder if he's yeah. okay. So there's just a creation of community, creation of social environment. But that's not what we're here to talk about today. No. Today, we're here to talk about another big part of my brain, not technology, not public <laughs> health, but something that has strong implications for both technology and public health, and that's climate change solutions. Do you know what I mean by a, a, man of, a renaissance manager, an English major who are also doing climate change? Whether certain solutions will scale or not, and whether they'll be a substantive part of our solution set. But the point there is more that I spend time thinking about how people internalize behavior and I've spent time looking at behavioral psychology and behavioral economics to determine what things will actually work in terms of being acceptable to people and will actually get past that barrier of human nature. Um, and so... Right. Oh, boy, it sounds like you are dealing with some of the things that absolutely keep me awake at night. And I, I mean, literally, I spend a lot of time in bed thinking about how we're going to break through some of the human problems that I see are wrecking democracy, frankly, making it impossible to, to make good political decisions, yeah, which, of course, includes climate change as the most obvious example. It but, does. You know, yeah. COVID as well, you know, people who are have don't want to wear masks or that's not what we came to talk about though we no. we agreed today we're going to talk about carbon capture absolutely and Lord knows that's a big enough topic let's talk carbon capture because um i'll share a, a i've got a couple of slides here um one of the things i am uh, you know carbon capture is touted as one of the big solutions um for climate change now this is a map of all the largest carbon capture sites in the world. Hold on. Uh, right off the bat, I think we have to be careful about when we use the word carbon capture and sequestration, because there's there are things that trees do. And then there's what I guess is generally called DAC, direct air capture from, okay, yep. from the air with machinery. And that's there's multiple types. Yeah, this, th these, are, um, these are not direct air capture. Um, I've spoken to the um, you know, leading people in direct air capture globally, but these are specifically at 
so there's there's kind of three levels to this. The first level is at source, so emissions from smokestacks and coal plants and stuff like that, um, or emissions from normal uh, oil and gas extraction processes. Um, that's what these are. These are at source capture and sequestration facilities. Now, is that are are you saying those little blue dots are the only ones in the world, or these are just happen to be the big ones? Uh, at as of 2019, these were all of the ones that were uh, sequestering uh, above a million tons a year, which sounds like a lot. I'll, I'll get into the context for that in a minute. Okay. Um, the second type is direct air capture, um, which I'll talk briefly about. The third type is biological pathways. Um, my thesis is very simple. Uh, mechanical and chemical uh, direct, uh, carbon capture doesn't work. It won't scale. There's no value proposition for it. Uh, the scale of the problem is vastly above the scale of the uh, ability of those technologies to scale. So um, uh, you're saying direct air capture and smokestack capture kind of thing, neither of them can be scaled. Nope. Um, and it's pretty simple to, to explain why. Um, but, you know, the, the one that will scale is biological mechanisms. And I'll talk more about the biological mechanisms. I'm going to start by being dismissive of the mechanical and um, industrial processes. So these are the sites. I've looked at all of them. I've assessed multiple technologies for um, uh, for sequestering carbon. I've you know, done a case study on carbon engineering, which is the big Canadian direct air capture solution. David I've Keith's outfit. <laughs> spoken directly to David Keith. He was unhappy with my coverage of his um, approach. Um, I've spoken to Graciela Chichelniski and Peter Eisenberger, who are behind the global thermostat direct air capture thing a decade ago. Um, I don't I know about that, but there's one, there's something in, in Switzerland Climeworks. With a branch in Iceland, right? Yeah, I, I haven't, I haven't uh, talked to any of the Climeworks people, but I've assessed their technology. I haven't published on it. Um, the problem is multiple fold. So let's just start with the scale of the problem. Okay. We're over a, um, a thousand billion tons of excess CO2 in the atmosphere that we've put there. And we are get, putting in 30 to 40 billion tons a year. That's B, billions with a B. So 30 to 40 billion tons a year. The biggest facility in the year captures a million tons a year. That's. Okay. One, and a, a billion is a, a thousand billion. A trillion is a thousand billion. So a billion is a thousand million, right? Correct. Yep. Okay. And so we're talking about totally different scale of magnitude. It is a scale of magnitude problem. Um, the um, uh, Exxon claims to have the most sophisticated and the best track record for carbon capture sequestration in the industry, and they do, but. Um, th so that's problem one is just these facilities just are tiny compared to the scale of the problem. The second problem is that the um, all of these dots, 90% uh, of them are used for enhanced oil recovery. Um, enhanced oil recovery means you pump CO2 down into a tapped out oil well and the chemical properties of CO2 mix with the oil and loosen it up. They basically turn tar into liquid and they pressurize it so then it can be pumped out the other end. For every ton of CO2 you pump underground in enhanced oil recovery, you get a quarter of a ton to a ton of new petroleum. And a ton of new petroleum turns into three tons of CO2. <laughs> so for one ton of CO2, you get three tons of CO2 at the other end. Uh, okay, there you go. <laughs> um, and that's not the end of the shell game. Let's take, um, <laughs> let's take Exxon's, um, uh, the, the one the facility that they really love to talk about, um, shoot, the Shoot Creek Processing Facility in the Permian Basin in the United States. It's one of the ones over here. Um, yeah. The, um, the Shoot Creek Facility it takes, it pumps up natural gas that has too much CO2 mixed in with it to be saleable. It separates the CO2 from the natural gas. It sells the natural gas. It pumps the CO2 over to the tapped out oil well and pumps it back underground. So it takes CO2 from underground. 
it puts it back underground and gets more oil. Yeah. And, and it gets more oil than it pumped out of. So there's no net benefit at all from Exxon's facility. It's actually a shell game. They take, they're pumping CO2 out to put it down somewhere else to get more CO2. Okay. All right. Now, okay. now another one. You got one. me already. You know I me. Mean? I'm not really good at arithmetic. And grade four was about my, my, my level. But <laughs> I think I can, I can figure that one <laughs> That one's pretty easy to figure out. Um, an, another one, which is um, a great facility, is the Sleepner facility over here in the North Sea. Uh, the Sleepner is, um, I think, you know, Odin's horse or something like that. You know, but um, the Sleepner facility is run by Equinor, which is the uh, Norwegian uh, National Petroleum Company. Um, it's a natural gas facility in the North Sea, and they pump out natural gas. And once again, it has too much CO2 in it. So they strip off the CO2 and they pump the CO2 back underground. And when they pump the CO2 back underground, they get a tax credit for carbon sequestration. Um, and so they've, they've avoided about, by my calculation, about $1.7 billion US by taking CO2 from underground and pumping it back underground. Oh Lord. Oh, so. Yeah. Now, now that right there, you just made the slam dunk case for carbon pricing as a carbon fee or carbon tax rather than a cap and trade kind of deal, right? Uh, there, I, I actually, there's different ways to sort out all of these types of things, but the, the reality is that all of these blue dots, 90% of them are just oil and gas companies creating more problems rather than less. If we take the natural gas that's burned from when the Sleepner plant puts CO2 underground, that natural gas goes on to be burned. So the CO2 they extract and then put back underground is a 25th of the CO2 that's created when the natural gas is burned. Um, you know, so there is no net benefit. It is a, I call carbon capture a fig leaf for the fossil fuel industry. Right, right. But these, so, they're doing this, they're getting credit in the sense of like a cap and trade bookkeeping system, not because uh, if, if they had, to, if somebody had to actually pay for every bit of, of greenhouse gas that was produced and emitted, then this couldn't happen, right? I, if they actually had to pay and they had to add, add it to the price, then the economics of oil and gas would be very problematic. Uh, if we think about the um, North America, the, you know, the oil sands that you and I contend with as Canadians, as a concern, um, let, let's take carbon capture, sequestration and use. There's a, a global market of 230 million tons a year for all carbon capture, use and sequestration. So 230 million tons a year. Global market for... Uh, what do you mean by a global market for it? Um, so uh, CO2 is a commodity. It's like, um, you know, well, it's like baking soda or oil or water. It's something that gets purchased in bulk and used for various things. Like CO2 is used for yeah, but carbonation. There's, there's so much more of it that, that we, it's amazing that anybody would pay to get it when the whole problem is trying to get rid of it. Uh, oh, I, I'm not going to disagree, but there's a $230 million market for it. People pay for its use. Enhanced oil recovery is 70 to 80 million tons of that global market. So right there, you're sitting there. And remember, the scale of the problem is thousands of billions of tons, and we're talking 230 million tons, right? So, the, the, okay. so people, people talk about carbon use. They're talking about not the enhanced, you know, they're talking about 230 million and trying to make that into billions, there's yeah. no use for all that CO2. Right. Yeah. But, but people do buy CO2. Greenhouses use CO2 to enhance growth. Um, soda, soda pop factories, presumably. <laughs> soda pop com companies use it. A lot of it's used to create fertilizers. Oh. Right? And fertilizers we need, right? We don't need billions of tons of fertilizer. Okay. <laughs> um, so, you know, if we think about the oil sands, the oil sands the way I worked it out is I, I calculated the total emissions from extraction and processing of oil sands petroleum, the, you know, the thick crude that the uh, Alberta produces. 
Alberta's annual emissions alone, uh, just for that, not for using the oils, not for burning the oil, just for extracting and pro initial processing, are as much as the global use of all CO2 for all enhanced oil recovery. You know, just one province of one country already blows the budget for that. And, and so this is the scale problem. Um, if there's the scale problem and there's the bait and switch problem. The, the fossil fuel companies are doing a lovely bait and switch. They get their social license to continue to extract oil and they convince everybody that all we have to do, we can capture it and we can put it somewhere. But there is no place to put it that's big enough and there is no use of CO2 that's big enough. Well, if they just pump it into a, an abandoned oil well or, you know, any other kind of uh, mine, underground coal mine or something, and they can seal it so it isn't going to get out, that's that's pretty good burial, you know. Uh, well, except that it's the scale there, of the Aren't there enough holes in the ground from old wells to be able to pump a lot of that stuff under there or not? Not a chance. No? Oh. Thousands of billions of tons. Okay. That's the scale of the problem. We don't have room for it. We There's nothing mechanical that can deal with that. There is a solution though. So I, I do, as I said at the beginning, I do want to show you this chart um, that I created. Um, so one of the things I did in 2019 when I was looking at these sites, I, I did an assessment saying how much had actually been captured and the 45 uh, million tons for the global carbon ca capture and storage market from 1970 through to 2019 includes the most generous calculation I could do for the enhanced oil recovery people. So for the enhanced oil recovery, I, I asserted that they would get 0.25 tons of oil for a ton of CO2, which is the low end of the scale, the minimum end. And then that turns into 0.8 tons of CO2 when it's extracted. So I'm giving them a 20% credit for enhanced oil recovery. In reality, as, as I said, it's typically going to be two to three times the CO2, but I, I was trying to be generous, right? Mm -hmm. And being generous, they've captured 45 million tons of CO2 since 1972. Remember, the scale is billions and thousands of billions of tons. They've captured 45. Now, what I also said was, hmm, what else could we have done with that same capital expenditure? Not the operating costs, not the salaries, just the money spent to build the facilities. And I applied that in each deck, in each year that money had been spent to you know, build one of these carbon capture plants. I said, let's build the amount of wind energy we could have built in that year with the capability of wind energy in that year because every megawatt hour of wind energy or solar energy avoids a megawatt hour of coal or gas. And so you can say, if I've got a megawatt hour of wind energy, electricity from wind, I've avoided a megawatt hour of coal and gas. And that's an average of about 750 kilograms of CO2 from those sources. It's about a ton of CO2 from a megawatt hour of coal, and it's about 500 kilograms of CO2 from a megawatt hour of gas. And so you can average those out, right? So what I did then Say is I again, said- again uh, comparing the, this gas and coal. Say it again. So uh, coal is a lot more carbon. Gas has some hydrogen in it. So the coal, when it burns, produces more CO2 than the gas does, um, about twice as much. So you get about a ton of CO2 from a megawatt hour of coal. That's how much it produces. And you get about a half a ton of CO2 when you produce a megawatt hour of, from gas generation. A megawatt hour is you're talking like a, a measure of electricity production. Yep. Now you, you've got a home and uh, I think you've got a condo, but if you had a detached home, the average Canadian... Um, gets about 10.7 megawatt hours of electricity they use every year for their home, for their homes, right? Okay. So that's your carbon debt. If you got 10.7 megawatt hours and you're in Alberta, you know where the uh, total CO2 per kilowatt hour is 790 kilograms per megawatt hour, you're creating like eight tons of CO2 just from your electricity in Alberta, and uh, you know much lower in BC and Quebec and Manitoba and Ontario. 
So my borders. household, my apartment is producing about that much. Your apartment, probably not because you're in a condo in a, you know, in Toronto, you're mm-hmm. probably in the, you know, uh, six megawatt hours and you're on the Ontario grid. So the Ontario grid is about um, because of, you know, nuclear and the, the wind energy that hasn't been shut down by the Ford administration and the solar that's in there that hasn't been shut down by the Ford administration. It's actually got pretty reasonable CO2 per kilowatt hour. It's like about 200 kilograms for a megawatt hour. So for you, for your carbon footprint for electricity, you're probably about 1.2 tons a year just for your electricity use because you're in Ontario. So it's not, you know, it's better than Alberta. Okay. You know, and, and there's a couple of reasons for that. You're in a condo, so you're sharing heating and cooling with your neighbors, mm-hmm. right? And so that's an energy efficiency matter. And secondary, you have a smaller space, so that's an efficiency matter. And third, you're on a grid that's not as dirty as Alberta's. But point of that is we can actually make a comparison. We can say we know that every um, megawatt hour we produce with wind or solar displaces fossil fuel generation. Yeah. Right. And so I made some. I haven't thought about it that way, but yeah, you could put those on the same graph, can't you? Yeah. And I did. Yeah. Um, here's the graph. Yeah. Um, so okay. this one basically says given the most generous reading of the enhanced oil recovery and given the most conservative capacity factors and ability and costs for wind energy, we could, we would have avoided about three times as much CO2 emissions just by building wind energy instead of all the carbon capture that's being built globally everywhere in the world. Okay. Uh, now I'm trying to imagine what my friend uh, I have a friend who's enthusiastic about the idea of carbon capture, not not direct air capture, but carbon capture. Th- she thinks that's that's um, you know we should put more into it. Now the question I imagine she would ask is, what are the how difficult is it to create um, such uh, facilities for carbon capture at source as compared to um, the uh, wind, building a wind turbine, for example. I mean, if it's a whole lot easier to uh, put some sort of little gadget on, on a smokestack, then it might be worth doing anyway, even while we're trying to switch over to wind energy, because um, it's go- they say it, it inevitably will take a long time to make that transition over to solar and wind. Now, sure. I, I, don't, I don't know whether, of course, I'm imagining what she might say, but is that the kind of argument that you would have to answer? Sure. And I'll answer it um, very clearly. Um, so in uh, Saskatchewan, we have the Boundary Dam Project. That's a coal plant that had carbon capture and sequestration bolted onto it. And the carbon that was captured was pumped underground for enhanced oil recovery in Saskatchewan. The idea was the enhanced oil recovery revenue was going to pay for the carbon capture. Um, the problem is, um, there were two problems. One is it ran f- at 40% of projected efficiency for a year and a half and nobody noticed. Um, <laughs> second, it <laughs> cost a lot more than they expected. So now every megawatt hour of electricity has a, um, has a, uh, a um, wholesale cost of $140 per megawatt hour. Now I'll turn that into kilowatt hours because you know you pay about 12 cents per kilowatt hour in um, Ontario. Well, in Saskatchewan, the wholesale, but that's your retail cost with all the other adders, the wholesale cost of electricity for this Boundary Dam facility was above Ontario's retail cost and close to Saskatchewan's retail cost. It was just too expensive to operate. So while they're keeping it running, the Saskatchewan Power Utilities and the Premier said they'll never build another one and they're not expanding carbon capture in Saskatchewan. So that's a Canadian example. Now I'll give you the Petronova example down in uh, southern United States. There's a big coal generation facility. They have, I think, 12 boilers um, on the facility and they bolted on carbon capture to one of them. Um, The idea being that they would, you know, test this out. So this is only one boiler out of 12. So they're already down at 8%. But then they were only capturing about 30% of the CO2 that was coming out of the boiler. And this is actually fairly standard efficiency 
for at flu capture. It's easy to capture 30% of it. It gets increasingly expensive to capture 100% of it, right? And so mm -hmm. that place, they spent billions of dollars and it failed. They've actually removed the car. They actually had to set up a gas plant, a natural gas plant to create the energy to capture CO2 from the coal plant <laughs> because capturing and running a carbon capture process takes energy. The big part, which I learned a decade ago, is that every CO2 capture process uses a chemical or sorbent based technology, which requires a bunch of heat then to separate the CO2 from the thing you've captured it with. And that heat has to come from energy and typically that comes from natural gas. And so you kind of sit there and you look at this and go say, we're going to spend a lot. Like let's, we talked about David Keith and carbon engineering, uh, their initial process as defined and as explored uses natural gas to power the process. They create a half ton of CO2 from the natural gas for every ton of air, CO2 they capture from the air. Mm. And so then they, they actually have in their design process, they have three different carbon capture technologies. They have one for the air and then two for the natural gas emissions. It's once again, it takes more and more and more to try and get to that 100%. They have to do two separate carbon capture processes on the, C on the gas emissions to capture all the CO2 to get up to that close to 100%. And so that's the problem. Um, we have a scale problem in that carbon capture doesn't get anywhere near the scale. We have a enhanced oil recovery problem in that it's used to create more oil and hence more CO2. And we have a shell game problem in that most of the stuff that people are claiming value from, the CO2 was already sequestered underground. They pulled it up and put it down somewhere else. And then we get to the air carbon capture problem. You know, the air carbon capture problem is Houston Astrodome. It takes one point, you know how big the Houston Astrodome is, right? It's one of the biggest enclosed spaces in the world. Yeah. It's this enormous building. It takes 1.1 Houston Astrodome's worth of air to get a single ton of CO2. Because mm -hmm. CO2 is really diffuse. It's a great space blanket that make, it's making your atmosphere warmer. But I, I did promise, and we only have... 28 minutes left. So I want to start talking about the solutions because I'll make it really clear the technical and chemical solutions that people are touting, especially the fossil fuel industry are not fit for purpose. Okay. Um, but there are solutions. Oh, I'll, there you go. There's I, one I, of them. You're going to make me happy now because I've been saying forestry and agriculture. Ray, Ray. Yep. And this is, the, this is the agriculture side of that. So right now we've got a bunch of the earth's surface under agriculture and that agriculture is pretty crappy. It's, um, it, uh, you know, we, it's, it emerged out of subsistence farming globally and they figured out they'd break up the earth. You had to break up the earth to remove the boulders and stuff like that. I mean, I personally dug up a garden in North Bay when we moved into a new house and moved all the boulders down and all did all that stuff for my mom because I was a teenager and I had lots of energy and it was the easiest way to keep me from breaking stuff that was useless. Um, and that's good the first time. Creating arable land the first time, you have to break the soil. You have to get rid of the stuff, the roots, the stumps, you have to get rid of the rocks and stuff like that. But after you've created arable soil, we've got into the habit of high tillage agriculture. And everybody's seen that. You run a plow across it and it tears up a furrow of ground and it throws off to the side. Well, there's three or four problems with that. First of all is that plow pan thing over here. Basically you end up with this compaction layer in the soil because you keep running heavy equipment across it that prevents stuff from going through it as easily. And you end up with that problem. Um, the second problem is your- Sorry, but you, uh, I, these diagrams are fascinating. On the one hand, you're talking about, well, the, the kind of uh, farming my grandfather used to do. He ran a plow up and spent all his whole life, 60 years with a plow. You yep. know? Now, but uh, now this, You've got rocks and layers of all things, but this plow pan, the thing that you're saying is gets hard 
is way down there. It's mm-hmm. not up toward the top. Is that right? Yeah, it's 20 centimeters down. That's like a almost a foot down. I didn't know that. So the top part is still uh, fluffy enough, but yeah, it's, it's way down there that it gets packed in. So that's problem one. Problem two is you can see the root network on the right. Um, what happens is that Every time, well, st- actually, I'll, I'll do statement two. Statement two is every time you run a plow across that top 20 centimeters of soil, what you're doing is you're ripping it up and you're turning it over. And then the biomass that's in the soil, a lot of it immediately decomposes, emitting the CO2 that it had captured. So if you got some corn roots in that top 20 centimeters or some roots from some uh, grain or something like that, what you're doing is you're enabling it to decompose rapidly. And when it decomposes, it emits CO2. Mm -hmm. Um, And so when you till, one of the first things you're doing is you're automatically getting rid of the CO2 that the root structures of your plants had put underground, at least for a while, right? Because underground, they still decompose just more slowly and differently. And there's different things that processes go on. But the third problem is the is kind of a bigger problem when you t- when you till you've got that plow pan you don't allow that network of biopores to draw the carbon down underground where it can be sequestered for the long term so you've got a short term carbon sequestration problem every time you till you throw a bunch of CO- co2 that was captured in the previous since mm-hmm. previous tillage into the atmosphere but two there's this lovely thing called glomalin. Now, Never glomalin, heard it. I know who has glomalin. nerds like me. Um, G L O M A L I N, glomalin. Now, glomalin is a protein which exists on fungus um, uh, threads underground. So, underneath, you know, I, I don't know how much time you spent talking mushrooms with uh, people, but Mushrooms are a huge deal. This mycelium networks underneath the ground are this massive alternative layer. Um, If you read The Wisdom of Trees, uh, what is it? Um, It's this great book by a Canadian um, about trees, uh, The Secret Life of Trees. uh, I think I did. uh, I read a book like what you're describing, whether same title, I don't know, but uh, about trees having a social life. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> and part of it is the types of fungus that exist underground. Yeah. Now, the value proposition here, I, I looked at the CSIRO, uh, I-R-O, C-S-I-R-O. Um, I rarely say that acronym out loud, but that's the um, Australian primary scientific research facility that has done a lot of work on climate change and climate actions. It's the equivalent of NASA in the United States, for example. And, and you know, most of the work that gets done on climate gets done out of CSIRO. Um, And they did a lot of work on um, soil carbon capture techniques. What their assertion and assessment after a bunch of time, and I did a lot of research and I published on this, you know, what I found and I talked to experts around the world and um, advocates and non-advocates was that it came down to glomalin. So there's, once again, there's that short-term thing. If you don't till, that short-term thing is really nice because you don't automatically release the CO2. But if you get rid of that hard pan and you've got, the second problem is when you till, you disrupt the mycelium network, the fungus roots under the soil. And the fungus roots under the soil have this glomalin and that's what binds carbon into long-term chemical depositions under the soil. So it takes about 150 years for the glomalin pathway into long-term sequestration to occur but every time you till, you disrupt that pathway. And so when we move to low tillage agriculture, from a climate sequ- from a carbon sequestration perspective, we automatically get the short-term benefit, which is useful for a decade or two, which is good. But we also disrupt. We, when we go to low tillage, we also start an- enabling this long-term pathway to occur. And so all of the land that's under agriculture, we want to turn into low tillage agriculture to allow both the biopores to get the glomalin process going and to prevent the biomass that's under the soil from just automatically turning back into CO2. Um, 
the good news there is that's a big win. We could get, if we turned all the agricultural soil, we get 20 or 30 years worth of um, stuff because soil stuff scales. The mechanical industrial stuff doesn't scale, but we have a lot of land under, um, under agriculture, right? And there's two aspects to this that are worth thinking about. Um, three or four, actually. The first one is about 80% of the land in the world is under control of corporate agribusinesses. 80%? Yep. Ooh, wow. Small hold, small hold farmers are a rounding error. Um, I, 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 pe oh. I, people get annoyed with me because I not, I don't really care about family farms uh, unless they're. All right. All right. All right. I, I'm, 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 I, I'm following you with, with enthusiasm. I'll, get, I'll tell you why, but go on. Yeah. Uh, Cause it's much easier to change an agribusiness's practice than a family farms practice. Um, there's only a few hundred agribusinesses that control the vast majority of the land under agriculture in the world. And the nice thing about um, agribusinesses, corporations, is they're sociopathic. They're highly rational and they seek maximum value. And they do it with spreadsheets and things like that. They do cost benefit analyses. They don't do it based upon what they think is nice, they do it about what maximizes their value. And that's good because that means policy levers that provide carrots and sticks will actually change their behavior very rapidly. You can go to those several hundred small number of agribusinesses and you can incent them to go to low tillage agriculture and you can penalize them for not doing it and you have a small number of actors and you can get a large benefit from it. You can also institute um, corporate monitoring programs with mandated monitoring of fields, and then you can put in place penalties for false monitoring. And you can do that because you've got a small number of, of actors again, right? Mm -hmm. If you wanted to go to, uh, the second problem is a lot of the small hold farmers are subsistence farmers or close to subsistence farmers. And subsistence farmers are calorie strippers. They strip every calorie they can for heat and food out of the atmosphere. If you look at um, Haiti versus um, the Dominican Republic, you know, down in the Caribbean, they're the same island. I've seen pictures. One half is brown and the other half is green. <laughs> and that's because on one half, Haiti is a very poor country and, they're calor and they're, they've got subsistence farmers everywhere and they strip every calorie, including cutting down every tree for, to heat water for their family, to be able to cook food so they don't die of food poisoning. Um, and so we've got to move all the small hold farmers, the subsistence farmers off the land. We, we can't prevent them from being on the land. We have to move more to agribusiness, which really sounds is con counterintuitive, but we've got, we actually have to give those subsistence farmers, those people in poverty who are stripping calories, something other to do, a universal basic income, guaranteed jobs, something, so that they stop stripping the calories and that land can go fallow again. And, and that's the third part, is a lot of the land that we have under agriculture today is wasted. The land that's in agribusiness land is highly productive. The green revolution is almost entirely an agribusiness revolution. And that's been a massive advantage over the past hundred years. Um, and small hold farmers, a lot of them are subsistence farmers and have not, they have very poor yields per acre. And it's hard to change them because they speak 500 languages and they've got to feed their families and they've got to feed them today, right? And so avoiding that means giving them something else to do um, and giving them sufficient, enabling them to feed their families and, and moving to agribusiness. Um, let, let me say where, I, I mean, you are setting me up to have such fights with all kinds of people, you know, um, you because all my friends, farmer, absolutely right? all my friends are going to say, no, the, the way to go is to try to give land back to small, small farmers, et cetera. Oh God, no. <laughs> and, uh, okay. But uh, the other thing is I, I have done a couple of shows with a guy named Tom Newmark 
who is the head of something called the Carbon Underground. He has a farm in Costa Rica, kind of a demonstration project of how to do it well. He's a wonderful, Mm -hmm. wonderful speaker. I mean, he's a very fun, fun person to talk to, but very smart. And and some of my uh, the people of uh, my uh, my community, my network who watch this say, well, that guy is a greenwasher because his argument was very similar to what you're saying. He says he works with um, going out and trying to uh, to deal with government officials, but also corporate leaders in the food industry, because mm-hmm. he says they are the people who are going to make the difference. They can put pressure on the people actually on the ground, digging, digging holes yep. or whatever. And that they, they know that we are ruining the soil and we don't have that many crops left in the soil before we're all going to starve to death from depleted yep. soil. And so they are aware, the corporate industry and the food, are, they're aware that they have, they're going to have to make some changes. So they are the ones, they're the place to go to get some changes made. And... Um, so, you know, my friends say, no, this guy is giving a justification for this corporate world uh, in which is going to, you know, take power away from ordinary citizens. The good yeoman farmer who was the backbone of democracy and the, you know, Jeffersonian uh, theory and so on. Uh, all of that is, um, you know, he's undermining that. So here well, you I, are just making a situation where I have to walk in and talk to these people. I don't know whether well, I'm up for it. <laughs> Last okay. couple of th- last couple of things about this. I, I'm going to talk directly to this point. In 1800, 95 percent of everybody were involved in agriculture directly or in secondary roles related to food uh, distribution. Today, it's three percent. Those nine, those 92 percent of people are people who go to universities, make computers, who um, do financial and you know financial banking stuff, who are the knowledge workers and who have leisure to create art. Um, you know, the art of history is the art of the 1%. The art of today is the art of the 80%. Um, the agricultural revolution has been tremendously valuable in terms of enabling us to flower as a species well beyond the people who have to get up at dawn, before dawn, you know, 11 months of the year, and do crop and animal husbandry related activities. Um, that's the efficiency of agribusiness and corporate scale. Um, and to be clear, we're keeping ahead of a Malthusian problem because of agribusiness <coughs> and the Green Revolution. Uh, a study came out recently, which I read uh, a couple of weeks ago. Basically, the we have achieved sin, in the past 40 years, a very substantial increase in efficiency per acre because of the agribusiness um, and green revolution stuff we're doing. We've lost 21% of that to climate change disruptions. Mm. Right. And so if we had not been moving the needle in terms of efficiency per acre, we would have gone backwards in terms of efficiency per acre. In the past 40 years, we've taken a billion of people out of abject poverty into what by our standards is still abject poverty, but they're actually able to make ends meet much more readily. We're taking people of being out of that position of being um, calorie strippers and making them able to have more leveraged jobs um, with a higher value for them and their families. Mm-hmm. And we're helping people stop living nasty, brutish and short lives. Mm-hmm. But we only have 10 minutes left and I do want to talk about trees. Yeah. So let's talk about the best possible carbon capture technology. Let's, let's imagine we're in 2100. We've got this nanotechnology, right? It's a small compact thing and you throw it on the ground. And in the, if there's water and soil, what it does is it absorbs some of the water and it starts to grow and it shoots a solar panels above ground to capture the sun and it shoots little pipes down under the ground and it builds them underground to get to water and it builds it up and then it builds out these pipes to give a scaffold to keep the solar panels erect and it drives the solar panels upwards to maximize the amount of light that hits the solar panels 
and it has this structure that it builds and it harvests carbon from the atmosphere to make the pipes and to make the solar panels and to make the mast that it grows up. And this amazing nanotechnology device, we, there's hundreds of different varieties of them that exist in different temperature and water and sunlight conditions. Bad, some are better on slopes, some are better on the flat, some are better at some types of, you know, there's some natural predators who like to eat these things. And we have those today. They're called trees. <laughs> this amazing nanotechnology, which is vastly beyond anything we can do, that self-assembles itself mm -hmm. into a store of carbon for long-term sequestration. All we have to do is plant seeds and seedlings. And, and water them and weed them and... Uh... No, 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 no. <laughs> You just have to plant them and step back because they'll figure out how to survive because that's what they do. You have to plant the right type of tree for the right area. You have to plant multiple types of tree in an area and you have to leave them alone for a long time. But if you leave them alone, they just turn into a mature forest. Life survives. Um, and so if we take this ex as an example, let's talk about scaling. I planted 12,000 trees with a friend on a, um, 25 acres in one weekend. 12,000. Okay. How did you do that? Well, he rented a tractor and it had a, a trailer behind it. And the trailer opened up the soil and we had racks of seedlings. And I sat on the trailer and I reached over and I put a seedling down into that opened up piece of soil between my legs. And then it closed it up behind me. And we just kept driving all over his farm planting black walnut and pine and beech and oak and maple. We planted 12,000 seedlings, two guys, two days. And we drank a fair amount of cream or beer in the evenings. Well, and you, you, it sounds like your truck was compacting the soil. Oh, I'm not saying it's perfect, but the nice thing about a tree is that it breaks through those pans. Oh. Uh, cause it's turned, it's take the soil and it turned it in. It took a farm area, a quarter acre, uh, uh, 25 acres, a quarter section. I think that it amounts to north of Cremor, south of Collingwood. And it turned it into a forest. I took a picture of that forest the last time I was up in that neck of the woods. Mm -hmm. And I sent it to my friend who now lives in Australia, um, Rob Large. And I'll have to tell him and his wife, who's a, um, studies parasites that I meant that I dropped their names, but that's two people, two days, 12,000 trees. And 12,000 trees means, oh, a tree consumes ab after about 40 years, a ton of CO2. So that's 12,000 trees. Oh, well, that's 12,000 tons of CO2. This is a big part of my own personal carbon offset, um, that and my climate action that and living in a tiny apartment with low carbon electricity and not owning a car because I live downtown so I can walk and bike everywhere. Um, but that's scalable. Now let's talk scalability. Let's talk about the numbers. A study out of Switzerland did a machine learning study of the world. I'm going to get into big numbers again, Meta. My apologies, but some of your friends, some of your guests are going to be, some of your viewers must be numbers nerds. So I'm going to give them some numbers. We used are to you have- talking about these Zurich people with their- Trillion trees? It's the trillion trees people. Okay. Yeah. I, I spoke to the lead researcher on that uh, as part of a study I did on, uh, I, did, I published a big report um, last year. Paul Verbos wrote the foreword for it, which is how we're talking, um, on machine learning and applied to clean technology and climate solutions. Um, so that was one of my big report from last year. But the Swiss guys, um, you know, they're, Th there are three or four big numbers here. First of all, we used to have six trillion trees on the face of the earth. Now we only have three trillion trees. We've cut half of them down. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them were cut down by those subsistence farmers because mm -hmm. they had to strip the calories off the land, right? It's just, we had, we're, we're locusts. As human beings, we're locusts. We cannot, we can avoid being locusts with intelligent practices and the right stuff. So we need the, the machine learning people said, the Swiss people said, 
if we planted a trillion trees, we'd get a bunch of carbon benefit. That's about equivalent to changing agriculture. We could get like a couple of decades worth of um, emissions captured before we lose ground again, right? Um, and once again, that turns into the glomalin pathway exists in forests as well. And so we have that long-term carbon, 150 year long-term permanent carbon sequestration as well. But a trillion trees is a lot. I, I recently ran the numbers for Pakistan because I did. But um, also you got to really plant two trillion because half of them are gonna die. Oh, but it, uh, the other nice thing about forests is once you plant a tree, once you plant a tree, it'll plant other trees by itself, mm -hmm. right? And so you don't really have to plant two trillion because you plant a trillion in the right way. No, um, you're not going to get more than half of them survive. Oh, I've but the point is, but the point is, if you plant a trillion, another trillion will get planted by the trees themselves. It'll just be a year or two behind. Except that that those that trillion trees has to survive and plant the next trillion. Yeah, and it does. Half of them don't. Yeah, I, I'm I'm not disagreeing. Point is that you know if we get to a trillion trees, we've got a, a win. Yeah, um, sure. Yeah, you know, um, <laughs> certainly better than nothing. Now, Pakistan has made a commitment yeah. to plant a billion trees. Yeah, look, a billion is uh, a trillion is a thousand billion. So exactly. a lot of countries go around saying, oh, we're going to plant a billion trees. Ha. Huh. Well, you and a thousand other countries, we might get there. But well, I'm and this is, the, this is the point of scaling, right? So yeah. how do we scale? So what is the scale for Pakistan? So I did a calculation. I said, um, let's assume that we have three different numbers that we would apply in some blend to figure out how many trees a country should plant. And so I said, maybe the gross domestic product compared to the gross domestic product of the world. That would be a good ratio, right? And Pakistan has uh, 216 billion annual um, GDP, and there's about an 80, billion, 80 trillion annual GDP and so that one says they should probably plant two and a half billion trees. So a billion trees isn't far off. From a population perspective, there's a different ratio. And from a land mass perspective, there's a different ratio. And you kind of add those up. So they should be planting somewhere between three and 10 times as many trees, given those ratios. Now, okay. But the bigger the country, you know, and the more GDP probably the more trees they should plant, right? And so Canada with our massive wheat fields and our, you know, on some, you know, some semi-arable land, we got a lot of trees up there already, but we clear cut a lot of trees too. I've walked through clear cuts. They're nasty places. Um, all that non-arable land in Haiti, all that arable land in Haiti, which is currently stripped for calories, that brown land, we should be planting it with trees. We should, you know, it. it I worked it out it would take about 8% of the total land mass of the earth to plant a trillion trees. It's only 8%. That gives a lot of trees, right? So that's not bad. Yeah, but a lot of those, the, the, that 8% is places like the top of a mountain where there are no roads and you can't get people in to do the planting, etc. Oh, but that's trivial now because um, now we have tree planting drones. We've got these industrial uh, Yeah, but I looked into those tree planting drones and they're not nearly as good as... I would wish. I was so excited when I heard about tree planting drones, but their survival rate, it varies from what kind of tree you're talking about. But uh, I've been, mm, the people I've talked to have actually done some studies of it. First of all, the companies won't tell you what the mortality rate is. They won't even, they don't even want to talk to me. But the people who've done some research also don't want to talk about it uh, because it's not very good, the results. Yeah. Point is, though, do we care if we plant 10 seedlings to get three survive? Personally, I don't because seedlings are cheap. Um, we can overplant, to your point. Um, similarly, in um, let's just take China because we've only got like um, a minute left. So let's take China. Um, as of the last, as of 2016, China had been planting trees as an intentional practice for 26 years. They started in 1990. At that point, they planted an area the size of France with 38 billion trees. 
So they were almost 4% of the way to the trillion trees by themselves. Wow. Um, and then in 2019, uh, they actually diverted 60,000 soldiers from the Red Army to plant trees. Mm. So China, oh, and once again, this is a calorie stripping story. During the um, you know, mistakes of the Mao era, they, did a, they devastated the landscape. Mm. They devastated the environment. And now they're making up for that. And in part, they're doing it for the secondary benefits of trees. They're doing it to reduce air pollution because trees make the air clean. And they're beautiful and they provide natural place habitat for all sorts of things. And they provide durable wood products for engineered hardwood construction and for other durable wood products, which sequester the CO2 permanently in a different way than the glomalin pathway. So we can plant a trillion trees. We can plant 2 trillion trees. We can, we have the technology. We can do this. We can change agriculture. And those are scalable, effective ways that actually have mar marvelous secondary benefits for humanity. But the entire mechanical and chemical stuff, it's just nowhere near a tree or a field. You know, I'm a thousand percent in favor of everything you're saying. And, you know, I, I've seen some issues about how hard it'll be to do, but I, I really do think this is the way to go. And um, my, my concern is with people who say, we don't really need to do that. All we really need to do is reduce carbon emissions. Uh, we, and, and I say, uh-uh, it's way past the point where carbon emission reduction will do the job. We have to do, we have to actually take stuff out of the air and, and the trees and agriculture are easily the most promising way to do it for, for sure. Easily. And the last thing I'll say on this is that I did a, I read a study recently of case studies of policy globally, seven case studies of co corp, a country policy. And the, all those case studies, almost all of them, except for oil producing countries were focused on biological pathways for carbon sequestration. The world's governments get this. We get a lot of PR from the fossil fuel industry about carbon capture. The average citizen doesn't get this, but government policy advisors do get this. Well, this little uh, uh, video is going to help move the public opinion <laughs> that much. <hope> so. Anyway, <laughs> this has been not only fun, but very, very enlightening. Yeah, you, you've, you've uh, brightened my day for sure. Madam, thank you so much. Mm -hmm.